dude, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely, man. It's a privilege and I'm blessed and I'm grateful that you have me on your show. And uh, like I said, I follow your Instagram. I see your YouTube and uh, congratulations on all your success and, and what you've been through. And I enjoy every interview you do, man. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm a big fan of yours. I remember seeing you on Breaking Ground years ago. <laughs> I've always been attracted to the wrestlers who are just like stupidly jacked. And I, I put you <laughs> in that category of being stupidly jacked. And I remember seeing you on there and being like, yep, that guy. <laughs> I, I remember that show. That was a good show. I uh, I was excited to be on that. Um, that was an interesting show. But yeah, the Jack part, man. I just try to stay in good shape, man. It's kind of been my uh, I, I think my whole what life. you're in is better than just good shape. <laughs> yeah, I try. You know, I try. You, so it's you've good. already been to the gym today? Oh, absolutely, man. I uh, actually just built um, a, a brand new gym in my garage, and I absolutely love it. Um, I finally got my dream home about six months ago. So I figured I put a nice little gym in there and uh, that garage goes up every day at eight o'clock. And for me, it's therapy. It's, it's, it's routine. I, I need to really start my day with that. And if I don't, my whole day feels off. Uh, for me, it's my balance in life. People still ask me today, you know, why are you still working out so hard? Why are you still look like this? For me, it's just like a lifestyle, right? Um, I've had the privilege to be around. One of my closest friends and best friends I've had a privilege um, and a mentor is Ray Lewis. And for me, it's like, he really instilled that in me, that a lifestyle is what drives you in every day. You know, you can't just turn on and off that switch and success. Right. So for me, going to that gym, hour, hour 15 is just, I shut the world off. I hit my music in and it's uh, how I start my day. And that's every day, seven days a week, five days a week, Monday, Monday through Friday. And then sometimes Saturday, Sunday. I'll do a, a cardio, but I'm big on like, um, I have an infrared sauna. I have a hot tub and a cold plunge in my house. So for me, all three of those is necessities, um, probably three or four times a week. So like in the weekends, I'll do like a nice sauna session, maybe some core, but I don't lift no weights on the weekends. I'm a big believer. If you train really hard Monday through Friday, you need those two days to recover, rest, and kind of get your body back underneath you. Yeah. Has this always been the way that you are? Or was this something that the NFL like instilled in you? No, you know what? I, uh, funny story. My dad used to make me do push ups and sit ups every night before I went to sleep. And you're, and and you're how old at this point? Four, three, four. And the funny thing was, some nights I would like not say goodnight to him. Like I brush my teeth and maybe jump into bed. I was tired. And he'd literally knock on my door. I'm like, you didn't say goodnight to me. And he's like, all right, give me, get down, give me 20 real quick. So, uh, it's just, I started to fall in love with the, with, with the, with the grind. I started falling in love with the results, the challenges. And for me, ever since I can remember, I mean, I, I want to be a professional athlete. I love sports. I love competing. I remember I was about three or four, I think five years old. I had a friend who was about five years older than me in the neighborhood. And I would ask him every day to race. And every day he beat me every day. Cause he was about six years older than me. And finally to the one day I beat him. And I just, realized right there and then I just always wanted competition. So for me, I just fell in love with the grind, the challenge, and just becoming a, a better version of myself. I know The Rock says that, you know, you versus you. I'm a big advocate on that. I really believe it's don't go on Instagram. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Just be a better version of yourself yesterday. And to me, that's the constant wheel in motion, right? Because you're never really, you're never going to be better than yourself than you were, you know, but you always continue to try to be better, right? So for me, it's like a challenge. I'm so curious then. I mean, you grow up, you're playing sports, you get the amazing opportunity to play in the NFL. Then you go to WWE. So it's all this competition. What are you doing now? <laughs> you know, that's a great question. So Chris, I'll tell you something. 20 years, I've been chasing it. 20 years. I left home at 18 years old, went to Oregon State to chase the NFL dream. Yeah. Um, I was privileged to get drafted in the second round to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Then that was over a six year journey. I get approached by WWE. Then I got to live in Orlando for five years. So, so long story short, for 20 years, I left home and I was chasing the dream, chasing the money, chasing the competition, chasing everything. Finally, after 20 years, I moved back home to South Florida. I got my dream home and I'm just living day by day. Really? I am. I, uh, I have investments. I have some businesses. Um, the biggest key I preach when I was in the NFL, I, I live under my means. You know, whatever you make, just try to live under your means. 
and you'll never have to be financially worried. So I have the privilege now at this part of my life to just honestly, like, enjoy life a little bit. I, uh, I golf a lot. I train a lot. I do some business advocates. But for me, I just wanted to take a year to myself, to be honest with you. As weird as that sounds, it's just 20 years. I mean, 18 years old, I just turned 38 and I bought my dream home back home. And for me, I've had a few properties in my day, but I never had a home, right? So now that I got a home base, I'm back home close to my family, uh, close to my friends, back to where I grew up at. So for me, I'm just enjoying the moment, taking it day by day, to be honest with you. I've just heard a lot of athletes and a lot of musicians say that the most addictive drug is that that crowd reaction, right? And you have Absolutely. for 20 plus years, you probably had it since Absolutely. you were five years old, you know? Absolutely. But like when that's not there as part of your <laughs> job, you know, what replaces it? You know, what's funny you say that I, I, I'm starting to get the itch again a little bit, to be honest with you, like what my next challenge is going to be. Yeah. And, you know, man, Mandy and I talk about it all the time. And, uh, I told Mandy that I was going to you know, take, a, take a year to myself after the whole, you know, because we get into the story later about WWE, you'll kind of realize after I, you know, I wanted a year to myself, um, but I am itching, you know, and for me, the qu answer to that question right now is golf. I know this funny sounds funny, but I'm obsessed with getting good at golf and I'm obsessed with challenging myself to be better because, you know, pro athletes have that obsessive personality, right? So if you have nowhere to put it, that's where like depression sets in, anxiety sets in. So you have to be able to compartmentalize that and put it somewhere. And Mandy makes a joke because I'm, I'm golfing three or four days a week and she's laughing at me. She's like, what are you trying to be on the tour? And it's like, no, but it kind of keeps me stimulated a little bit, right? So it's just for the moment. It's just it, as I, in life. And I know something, I'm excited for the next journey. Whatever comes, whatever comes next, I will attack it the same way I attacked NFL, WWE, college football. So, um, but yeah, to answer your question, it's just coming back a little bit. WrestleMania kind of hit me differently, to be honest with you. Mm. When I was watching Mandy, uh, I was so happy. I'm, I'm her biggest fan, man. I really am. I'm, I'm Mandy Rose's biggest fan. I'm so excited for her success. She's doing so well. She's a champion. So, But when I watched WrestleMania, that was like the first weekend where like I just had to like kind of go for a walk, go for a little run, you know, because it was just like I know I'm so competitive and I know the character Tino had so much to bring to the table and I know he was in his prime and I'm just still a little bit, you know, like it's just, it's just to me, it's like, I know wrestle, uh, Tino could have been on that, on, on that stage at WrestleMania on the highest in, in the main event. And I truly believe that. And that's why I stuck with it for so long. So that was uh, the itch came back up at WrestleMania that's what you're asking. So it did come. Yeah. You were, I mean, you were so close, right. With everything oh. you were doing. And we'll get into this some more, but I feel like that must be difficult, especially when Mandy's just absolutely crushing it. And you're like, I want to be doing that too. Well, absolutely. And, 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 and you know what? Honestly, you're right. I, I do. But at the end of the day, I mean, I do think, obviously, we could have been an incredible power couple in the industry. Uh, we could have done a lot of things maybe together. But that being said, I, I really am truly so happy for I'm her biggest fan. And I, I wish anybody success. I wish everybody success, right? And I try to help everybody become successful because I think that's what true success is. You help others become successful. So for me, it's like, I love watching Mandy on the journey. I try to help her through the ins and outs of it financially, professionally. So that being said, but yeah, it's, um, I, uh, I try to be in a humble way, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough because uh, it, it, you know, what Tino brought to the table, I, I'm, I'm not sure if WWE's ever seen it. And I mean that in a humble way. So uh, the stars were lined up and we can get deep into it. I would love to tell some of my story because people don't know. People really don't know what happened, where I went, and then, I, and then I'm the only person they brought back. So it's it's deep. It's deep. But uh, yeah, it's, I, 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 it's deep for well, sure. I mean, let's get into it. Where, do, where does that story, do you think, where does it begin? Oh. You still got me? I can hear you. Hold on, I cut you off. Hold on. Oh, oh the Bluetooth has died in his earphones. No, I think I pushed my button. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, how do I? Oh, okay. Let's see if I get this. this, is, this let's is see if I get this. Better. There you go. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> so, I love it. We're going to keep that in too. For you, where do you think that that story begins? Then. Oh well, let's go back to the beginning. Let's talk. Let's talk about yeah. the beginning. Let's put it on the table. We, so, the very beginning with WWE or the very, very beginning? With no, football? WWE. Okay. Let's go with WWE. Let's go with WWE. Um, first off, was extremely grateful for the opportunity because um, I was going through a transitional phase in my life. You know, I played six years in the NFL. 
I was very grateful, but it, I was very bitter because I was in my prime. I went through a couple of things I didn't agree with. I never been cut. My kind of career ended like that. Like I literally started my last game on national TV, had like eight tackles, had a hell of a game and then never played again. And it was a mental struggle for a year, let's say. So that being said, WWE came along. Um, Canyon Seaman was the first person to call me and he offered me the opportunity. And I was like, really? I was like, you know, I was a casual fan. I mean, I was a casual fan. I was Stone Cold, The Rock. I wasn't a diehard, but I was a casual fan. So he offered me this opportunity and uh, he they actually flew me out to Orlando and uh, I did a little tryout with them and they offered me the opportunity. So I, I thought about it. I thought about it about three months and I said, you know what? It'd be an honor. I was extremely, I was extremely honored. It was a privilege to be another professional athlete in a whole different industry. So I took it. I humbled myself. I moved to Orlando. Uh, I started from the bottom. And the tough thing about that is you, you suck, right? You're, you're not good at something when you start something new, and right? You've just come from being one of the best football players in the world. Very few people and, make it to the NFL. So that's, that's where it's, you're struggling. You know, I, I was playing in front of 80,000 people, right? Uh, my, 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 I had the banner on the stadium. My, my jersey was a number two seller in 2009 for Tampa Bay. So I went from playing in front of 80,000 um, to going to the PC and setting up rings in front of 100 people. And, 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 and by the way, and I don't know if everybody talks about this, you go from being a millionaire, like making millions, to now making you know, 50 grand or something. There's nothing wrong with making 50 grand, but wow, what an adjustment. So I'm glad you said that because that's where I had to really, um, again, I mean, it's in a humbling way. I was extremely grateful, but I really had to humble myself because like you said, um, I was all in. I bought, I, I was all in. I told Triple H, I had a meeting with Triple H and I said, um, I'm all in. And I knew I had to start at the bottom. So again, I humbled myself. I went to the PC, uh, whatever they asked me to do, I did. I didn't know how to wrestle. I had to learn how to wrestle. Okay. Then I, you know, had to go set up rings in front of, you know, I, I was in locker rooms with like cockroaches and, you know, I'm, I'm used to playing in front of 80, 90,000 people where I'm escorted to my car. So for me, it was like, okay, Sab, stay the course, stay the course. And for me, I was just like, again, I bought it. And I dedicated my life to, I moved to Orlando. So I get started, I get started going. And I don't really know what to expect, right? So I developed this character that they kind of wanted me to be. And it was just kind of like, it was kind of a version of me, but turned way up and just kind of like a person you really, you wish you could be, I guess, right? So I start this character and uh, I started getting booed out of arenas. And I'm starting to think like, wow, okay, like, this is good, this is good. And, but I'm learning the inside and out to wrestling. And I'll tell you a funny story. One of the good friends of mine, when I, when I told him I was signing with WWE, he goes to me, I didn't know how to take this. He goes to me, I think you're going to be really good at that. And I said, well, what do you mean? Why do, you, why do you say that? He goes, you just have a canon ability when you walk into a room, people don't like you. And I'm like, and I remember looking at him like, did you just say, like, I was kind of insulted, yeah. but it kind of carried over to the character Tino. So fast forward a little bit, you know, I, I pay my dues. I learned how to wrestle a couple of years goes by. Um, Triple H approaches me and says, listen, Tino, um, you look like a million bucks. You talk like a million bucks. You carry yourself like a million bucks, but I really want your wrestling to be a million bucks because when you have a package like your, like the character Tino, if you can't wrestle yet in the ring, they'll kind of expose you and it won't be exactly where we know you can be as a star. So for me, I took that personal, like, okay, like, let me really hone in. And I'll tell you something, that craft is hard. It's, it's not something you learn overnight. It's not something you can just teach somebody and go out and do it. It is so many different aspects of playing a character, wrestling in the ring, listening to the crowd. And for me, it, it wasn't easy. It, it really wasn't. And it was almost like the reverse because being an explosive athlete, it's like the opposite in the ring. It's like you pretend like you're moving fast, but you're not really moving fast. Mm -hmm. So I said to H, I said, all right. I said, I take that as a challenge. So he says to me, uh, I'm going to team you up with Riddick Moss. He goes, he goes, Riddick Moss is good at what you need to work on. And he goes, you're good at what Riddick Moss needs to work on. I said, perfect. Let's team us up. Yeah. And again, you know, Matt Cap obviously is doing really well and I'm happy for him. And it's another, it was another kind of alpha presence, right? Another athlete, another football player. So at first we were kind of like, 
button heads a little bit, right? Um, but for me, I was very grateful because he taught me so much to be in a tag. He taught me so much about the psychology of wrestling, uh, the pace of wrestling, how the flow of the match goes. And he, I was extremely grateful. I know he didn't really want to be in it at first. And maybe I didn't really want to be in it at first because we thought we were stars, individual stars. But as my career came, it really, really helped me. It, it, I feel like it started to catapult me. So fast forward about three years in, about three and a half years in, I, I, I came to a realization. I was like, okay. Um, at the time, I was like 35. And I said, I gave everything I had to, to WWE. So I wanted to sit down with Triple H. And I said, H, you know, what's the plan? And I, I sat with H for 45 minutes in Atlanta. I'll never forget it. And he said, listen, Tino, he goes, I, I see you as, as a huge star. He goes, we just want the timing to be right with you because of your background, what you've accomplished. You know, we just don't want to throw you out there. We want to really make sure all the stars line up. So I, again, I bought into that. I was excited. So he says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to break you up on TV with Riddick Moss. And here we go. Let's go. Yeah. Well, that happens. I was in three main events in a row against Aleister Black for the belt, Velveteen Dream, and then somebody else, I think. And I was catching, I was catching my pace. I was like, wow, I feel comfortable in the ring with really good wrestlers. I'm, I'm getting it. So I had a match with Aleister Black for the belt in Gainesville, and Terry Taylor was there. And at that time, he pulls me aside and he says, that's the best match I've seen you work ever and I was really excited he goes I'm telling Triple H personally myself mm. so I'm, I'm sitting in the back and I'm excited it's a Friday night the next morning Saturday um, I had a day off I get a phone call about 11 o'clock in the morning from Terry he said Tino you want to work the main event tonight against Velveteen I said absolutely so I'll be there all right perfect get my car drive over to uh it was in uh Venice no sorry it was in um where was it at it was in uh, maybe Tampa somewhere, somewhere in Tampa. Long story short, get in the main event with Velveteen. He started doing his comeback, and he drop kicks me right in my pec. And I went to brace for him a little bit, and his foot tore my pec. Mm. Like, it's just the way – if he did a 1,000 more times, he wouldn't do it again. Freak accident. So now I have a tore pec, okay? So now, like I said, I've been three main events in a row. I'm – they told Triple H as the best I looked to get the title match. So I'm like, on the way up, I'm about to get my singles debut. I get hurt. Mm. Tear my pec. So long story short, get the pec, surgery repaired, great surgery. Everything was great. Um, as I'm out, I tell WWE I had a little bit of an elbow problem, like just from lifting weights, football wear and tear. I said, let me get this elbow scoped out while I'm out. I'll come back. I'll be 100%. We'll hit the ground running. Perfect. Let's yeah. get it done. Right. Perfect. I go to the surgery. It's supposed to be a 30 minute surgery. This is what people don't know. It's supposed to be a 30 minute scope. They got eight pieces of bone fragment out of my elbow. The last fragment, the tweezer they were using snapped off inside me and vanished. I was on the table for five and a half hours while they were digging around trying to get the piece out. Now I was obviously still sleeping. They kept pumping me and pumping me. Finally, after five hours, they get the piece out. So I wake up and I, he tells me what happens. And I'm just like, no, that's not what happened. I, I know my body, something's wrong. You know, nothing's wrong. I promise. No, I can't feel my hand. It, I can't feel nothing. It's one of the worst pains I've been through. Long story short, fast forward again, two months later, my hand never comes back. My hand has like dropped hand. He would shake my hand and crush it. I had no strength, nothing. Well, they compressed my owner nerve. So now I had no feeling in my hand. So I had to have a third surgery the same year in December. And I go to the best neurosurgeon in the country. She does the surgery. She says, listen, it's either going to be three months or three years. I can't tell you when your strength comes back. I said, really? So that was, so that was a third surgery that year. So WWE stood behind me. They paid for everything. They paid me during the whole, I was on the shelf for two years mm. and it was discouraging. Say the least, but I, I wanted to fight through it. I wanted to come back because I knew I was right there, right? I was right there to be that next, like I felt that I was going to be that star. And for me, what kept me going was legends like Scott Hall. You know, he pulled me aside one day at a show, never met the guy. 
um, and a legend in the game. He pulls me aside and he says, kid, he goes, you have an, a canon ability for people to hate you. He goes, you got that it. He goes, don't let anybody tell you different. So for me, those were like the moments that kept me, you know what? Maybe I should still chase this dream. Let me chase this dream. Let me chase this dream. And I also remember another one was the great Dusty Rose before he passed. Um, I had the privilege to sit with him a few times and he pulled me into the office and said, son, you got the it. The way you carry yourself, your persona. So those conversations kept me going through the dark times, right? Because I could have easily walked away because financially I was okay, right? Eventually I was, I was struggling. But for me, it was like, do I continue to, I started out, I started this journey out, let's finish this journey, right? Yeah. So Triple H says, we want you to come back. So I worked my butt off. I got back in physical shape, mental shape. All of a sudden I get cleared. I get cleared 2020, like end of February. Well, two weeks later, COVID hits. So COVID hits now. Vince McMahon says, anybody's not on TV or hasn't been on TV is gone. Mm. So I get a phone call from Canyon Seaman. And he's like, Tino, I'm sorry. This is, this is bad news for us. You know, we have to let you go. I'm like, let me go. I'm like, you guys just paid me for two years. I, I literally just got back up to character and you know, let me go. And he's like, this is not our, this is not my call. Trust me. They didn't really tell me much kind of vague, but I was really like, wow. Like I bought in, I bought in, I gave everything I had for five years and you guys just called me, let me go because of, uh, of this. So I, I was struggling, but that being said, um, Canyon did text me almost every week. He's like, listen, we're going to get you back. We're going to get you back and get you back. But I didn't, I didn't really believe it at the time. Right. Mm. So long story short, then AEW comes into play. AEW calls me. Um, it's actually Billy Gunn. Billy Gunn calls me. He says, hey, hey, Savvy, show up to uh, Jacksonville, so-and-so. So I show up. They don't tell me nothing. He don't tell me nothing. I show up. I see my name on the board for a match, right? And I'm like, wow. I'm like, they didn't even tell me. They didn't ask me, but I was like, yeah, hey, I'll do it. I'm excited. Let's go. Yeah. So I have a tag match on AEW. I think it was AEW Dark. Yeah. And um, it was a good match, fun. But again, they didn't tell me anything, right? They didn't offer me nothing. They didn't tell me much. It was kind of like a very vague, uh, trip. So that same week, uh, I think it was Coach Bloom texted me, a good friend of mine was ahead in the PC, like, congratulations. And I think I shot him a text back, like, thank you, but I didn't sign nothing yet. And next thing you know, the next day, Triple H reaches out to me. <laughs> and <laughs> so funny he how starts that happens. <laughs> oh, it's, And you know what's funny? Here's some comical Canyon. And Coach Bloom was trying to set up a meeting between me and Triple H for about two months. But again, you know, Triple H is so busy that, you know, it just kind of kept getting pushed to the back burner, which I was getting a little offended, but I know they were pushing for it. So it's just funny that he called me the week I went to AW. So yeah. long story short, I sat with him and he, he goes, you know what? Uh, you're the only person we're going to offer to bring back. We want to bring you back. I said, okay, H. I said, um, I'm, again, I'm honored privilege but i gotta be honest with you i asked one thing I, I bought into everything you asked me to do for five years i humbled myself i was extremely grateful all i want is an opportunity yeah. just an opportunity for the character tino because i felt like he was the dude that like everybody kind of talked about that everyone, oh you know wait till vince sees tino wait wait till this happens wait till he gets his push and it was like one of those that never really got the push yet one because of the surgeries and uh one because of the surgeries and then just bad timing but now here we go they bring me back so they they signed me back i'm the only person they brought back from like the first wave of releases triple h says okay tino come back to the pc get some ring rust knocked off and uh we're off and running yeah okay come back to the pc this is, uh, what is 20? So this is um, what, early, so this is early, this is late 20. Okay. This 2020, early 21. So I come back and uh, I'm in every main event that they, they were, we were doing like house shows to kind of um, emulate. We weren't having road shows, but we were doing house shows in-house to like kind of, you know, rehearse. When they were big, there were big shows. And I was in like every main event. They had me against Ciampa, Thatcher, everybody that, every different skill set. So I'm like, okay, here we go. Like, I'm going to get the push. They keep saying, you know, we're, we're packaging you, we're branding you, you're, you're next. You know, Johnny Russo was texting me every week and he's so excited. But I kept getting put off. 
like, oh, next week, next week, oh, this, this. And I'm like, and then I started to start, and I started to start get a little upset because I'm like, hold on. I came back because we spoke about getting a big opportunity. Then, then I started to hear, you don't fit on NXT. You, we're going to put you right to Raw and SmackDown. You know, we, you don't really fit in this brand per se. Okay, I kept hearing that. I'm like, okay, well, I'm like, well, I just want an opportunity. Yeah. So, again, this is probably the first time in my career that I felt fully confident in the ring. I, I, I felt I could wrestle with anybody. I felt like I could call a match on the fly. I was comfortable. So now I'm like, okay, Triple H told me I look like a million bucks, talk like a million bucks, walk like a million bucks, carry myself like a million bucks. Now I think I can wrestle with anybody. So I'm ready. All of a sudden we have, we have a, a match um, for, uh, we had Jamie Noble come, we had Johnny Laurinaitis, and we had um, another right-hand man for Vince. I, I'm, I'm going blank on his name right now. Pritchard. Pritchard. So they come to the PC and they say, we want to see a match of your best talent. So they put me in the main event in front of them. First, first they had promos in the main event. So I cut a promo. I'm in the main event. Crush it. And I tell you this because it kind of piggybacks what's coming next. Jamie Noble. You remember Jamie Noble, obviously. Of course, yeah. Pulls me aside and says... He goes, that promo you cut, he goes, you can't teach that. He goes, the confidence you speak with, can't teach it. He goes, great, best promo of the day. So I asked him, I said, what about you think about the match? He goes, two top guys going at it. I loved it. Physicality was great. He goes, you're my guy. I'm going to tell Vince. So I'm like, good, here we go. We got somebody on the inside seeing me in person. Let's go. You know, no one got me in front of Vince yet. I, I heard for years, Chris, years. Wait till Vince sees you. Wait till Vince, you're a Vince guy. So I'm like, okay, well, put me in front of this. Yeah. So Jamie Noble says that um, two weeks later, I get a phone call from Canyon Seaman. And I get released again. And I'm like, hold on. I literally thought he was calling me to tell me I was going to SmackDown and Raw because for about three months, they kept saying, you know, I think you're going to go right up. You're not going to go to NXT. We don't really have a story for you. I think you fit here. You fit here. You fit here. So I get a call that I'm being released. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. And me and Canyon had a really good relationship at the time. But I could tell he he couldn't tell me the reason. He was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Tino. Uh, this is devastating to me. Um, and hangs up on me. So I'm very like, at, I'm not at ease right now because I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm like, I didn't have to come back. I was great. I was excited to come back. Triple H offered me another deal. It was kind of a, a man-to-man handshake and an agreement. Yeah. And now I'm gone. And I'm like, hold on. So I was, I was upset. I, I didn't get no answers, Chris. That's what hurt me the most was like, I didn't get an answer. Like I literally was just in every main event. I was in the main event for the biggest show you put on for Jamie Noble and Johnny Laurinaitis who were Vince McMahon's right-hand man. So I'm like, where's the disconnect here? So I was struggling. So then I, I this is what for me, I lost a little respect because I didn't get a call. I didn't get a text from Triple H. I called him and I reached out to him. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't respect that, man, because I felt like I gave him everything I had for five, six oh. years. And um, and he told me, and numerous people told me that my character had star main event caliber potential. But how do I never get a shot? Nothing? Like so for me. The exit was 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 rough. What and do you think, what uh, do you think happened then? <laughs> I know what happened, but they're not allowed to publicly say it, I guess. Well, um, I mean, obviously you're watching NXT now. The whole thing's different, right? Everything's yeah. switched. So Vince is in a fad all of a sudden because I think it's a business plan, but um, he wants young, 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 young. Yeah. And I couldn't wrap my head around that for two reasons. One, People still think I'm in my 20s. And, and I said to him, is there anybody that looks like me here? If there's anybody built like Tino, then I'll walk away. If I'm, if I'm old and out of shape, fine. But yeah. You're going to tell me I fall in an age category? So for me, it was very unsettling because I had a conversation with Johnny Laurinaitis. And let's say the least that I want to be professional here. I actually, when he was done talking to me, I actually wanted to ask him, do you know who I am? 
because it was so generic, right? It was so like he was just talking to a script. And I'm like, like, no disrespect, but like this, you know, like Tino, like you, like do you know who you're talking to? Like, I felt like he was reading off a script. And I was like, and he told me, like, personally, he said something to me that I, I just I couldn't fathom and I didn't want to be disrespectful, but he just said to me, yeah, he didn't want to say age because supposedly they can't say age now because that's like politically not correct. But I knew it was age. Everyone no, told I, think me it was the, age. I think there's like a lawsuit if there's ageism, I think. A hundred percent. Yeah. But it's age, right? So I think Vince saw a name on a piece of paper, Tino, six years in NXT, hasn't been a star yet, 37 years old, get him out. Mm. And I know stories from Canyon who were in those war rooms who told me straight up, there's people that fought for me, but he didn't want to hear it because he never saw me. And that's what, what, what is the unease that for me, it's like, how do I never get my shot to be in front of a guy that you told me for years was going to fall in love with me. And for me, that was tough, man, because Again, I mean, in a humbling way, I was extremely grateful for this whole opportunity to be in, in WWE. And it's a privilege, man. It really is a privilege. Sure. Um, but I also thought that I deserved a chance after buying in and doing everything they asked. It's and it was nothing to do with the money. Triple H guy. And then when Triple H wasn't the guy in charge anymore, you got forgotten about. Well, see, that's there's no straight answers going on over there right now. Right. And now Triple H is out. Right. Of, of, of he don't run NXT no more. And that was his baby, which was confusing. Um, I just you know what the sad reality is? I don't know. I actually had other wrestlers come up to me and say, you know, you don't really fit in NXT with your persona and what it is. I Because if you ever if you look back a couple of years ago on NXT, NXT's brand and Triple H said this publicly, he was very adamant about being the best in ring brand right the johnny wrestlings the uh, gargano's you know the people who wrestled indies their whole life that were really good at wrestling yeah. they weren't really as much character based they weren't really much as you know presence based um so i didn't think i fit in for a while i, th I thought it went a little different different direction because i was never a guy that was going to be the best wrestler in the ring that's best worker i was a guy who just as a character, people hated. They hated. I mean, I, I remember Dash and Dawson, who I look up to, FTR, yeah. who was the revival in NXT, who I think are the best in the business. Not only from how they wrestle, for how they approach the business. I really respect how they love the business. And I remember he pulled me aside one day and he said to me, you get more heat I've ever seen from a character that hasn't even been pushed yet. So from a guy like that, who's telling me a compliment, that's what kept, again, kept me motivated to, to keep going. Cause I wasn't getting my, I wasn't getting a chance, but I was like, all these people are telling me what I have. Let me just get there. So when I got that, that, that crappy phone call last year, and then I just I didn't sit with me well, man, because I'm just like, I, again, I mean this in a humbling way. I'm like, you have a character who's 6'4", 6'3", 6'4", 240, built like Superman, a real world-class athlete, real world-class athlete, been successful, lived the life that I'm trying to portray, knows how to carry himself in and out of the ring, knows how to publicly represent the, co the company, and you don't want to give... Like, I, I couldn't put it together. Like, I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. And it's like, and everything in the world, right? And it's like, you have a guy like that, and, and, and sometimes you want to go with this guy that on the indie? Okay. Uh, I, I guess I don't understand the industry, right? So I tried to be humble, but I'm like, come on. Like, really? And, and that's what, for me, was the disconnect, man. It was the disconnect that I just couldn't, I don't know. And that's just, that's the truth. Now, I'm just talking me and you freely, man. And I mean it in a humble way, but a lot of people don't know the story that Tino went through. Do you think the door is still open for you to go back to WWE? Man. You know, I, the sad thing is what I heard about the age thing is I say no. Hmm. I personally think if Vince ever saw me 
face to face and he saw me in a ring and saw me how the audience used to boo or cheer or whatever it was. I, I would say I would I would hope so, man. I really do. Um, you know, if I ever saw Vince face to face, I I I don't know what I would say because for me it was like I just felt like they hid me. They told me they hid me from Vince until I was 100% ready. Like Triple H would tell me this. He goes, when I give you to Vince, I want you to be that dude because you can be that dude. So. Yeah, you look like I a just, million bucks. Like you, you were like the epitome of what Vince looks for, at least from all the stories that we've heard. You know, Chris, um, this is just my opinion from being in the business for six, seven years, so, oh, well, five, six years, being around everybody. Um, I want to say this with the right content. Um, and I've had people say this to me. I'm not, I'm not saying this because I, I just is my opinion. I've had people say this to me even now. I personally think the character Tino was a huge missed opportunity and a drop ball on WWE's part. My opinion. Mm -hmm. not to, and what I mean by that is not even to get like a push, not even to get like a real shot. Right. Like I had like cameos here and there and a tag, and, but it wasn't never like what they were telling me behind the, the scenes. And for me, it's like, how do I walk away now? Like there's a part of me that doesn't want to walk away because I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I, I learned this new craft. I fell in love with the business. I respect the business. Um, I wanted to become great at the business. Right. I, so for me, it was like, hold on really? You guys could almost like amp me up that I could be this next person, but never even get a shot. Like, I think for me, if they gave me a push and I failed, I'd be like, Hey, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm so humbled. I'm so grateful. It didn't work out, but I'm on my next life, but I didn't even get that like push anything, yeah. nothing. Right. Yeah. And like, it, that's what kind of, kind of sometimes still eats me up inside. Is there the chance to go be that star in AEW? Is the door still open there? You know, it's funny you bring that up. Man. And and I, and here's here's the thing. I don't know what happened or where it went wrong. And this is the truth of everything. Um, that that bridge was burnt, and I don't know how because Tony Khan, who's known me from football. Obviously, his dad owns the Jacksonville Jaguars. Yeah. He knows me from the NFL days. I've met with him even when I was in NXT. I saw him when I went to AEW. And when Triple H and WWE offered me a contract, I actually text Billy Gunn about it. And they didn't put anything on paper. They didn't offer me nothing. So it wasn't like I took their offer, threw it to the side, and went back to WWE. Triple H was the first one to throw a number at me throw an opportunity. I mean, I wanted to go back to where I got my first opportunity, right? Yeah, sure. So I went back, didn't think anything of it. I actually sent a very, very nice text to Billy Gunn, thanking him for the opportunity, thanking him to get me in the door. I told him I was signing back with WWE. He congratulated me. I, everything I thought was good. Well, the funny thing is that the day I got released again, I had somebody reach out to AEW, Tony Khan personally, and said, hey, you know, Tino's a free agent and this kid's can be a star. And he said to him, again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit because he wouldn't really tell me, but basically Tony was upset that I went back to WWE. And I thought, I didn't think, I didn't even believe it the first time I heard it, right? I didn't believe it. Then about three months ago, Andrade approached me and he says he wants me to be in a group with him. And me and Andrade always had a tremendous relationship. Um, I think he's one of the best workers I've ever seen in the ring by far. Mm. He called, he, he texted me personally. Um, and we actually shot a vignette together, me and him. He wanted to be in this group. He wanted to bring back a group like, um, you know, like the, the Ric Flair, Randy Orton, Triple H days. He wanted to bring back that group to AEW. So oh, we shot like the evolution. video. Evolution, absolutely. Yes, yeah. like evolution. So we shot the video. We spent the whole day in Miami together. We had the nice three-piece suits, the nice cars. We did a whole video. Um, this is where I heard it the second time. And now I know it's true because I didn't think it was true. He, 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 he texts me back and he says, Tony Khan loves the idea, loves everything about it. But he kept saying, you know, no, no Tino, no Tino, no savvy. And I'm like, what do you mean? No Tino, no savvy. He goes, he wouldn't tell me, would not tell me. He goes, just, let's just find somebody else. And I thought that was weird because 
I would love to sit and talk to Tony personally because I don't know if there was a, a, a disconnect between me and him, if somebody told him something that they didn't tell me. But I think he might have got upset that I went there, did one match, and then signed back with WWE, which I had I had an intent. I just wanted to wrestle. I just wanted an opportunity, right? So when yeah. AEW called me, I just wanted an opportunity. Yeah, and then, so I and thought then that I'm was sure a strange. Thought, but then the story came out. Then your name got attached to about leaking storylines from <laughs> AEW. <laughs> Oh man, Chris, let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. I, I have to laugh. I have to laugh. And if anybody knows me, first of all, um, I, I don't even know where to begin with this. I, I don't even, first of all, I, I'm like internet, like kind of a dummy. I, I don't even know what a dirt sheet is. I, I don't even know. I don't even, I'm, I don't even use Twitter. Like I, I'm not, I don't go on Instagram. I don't go on internet. I don't go at any of those things. I'm not even one of those people to even talk about that. So I heard the rumor came out. So I was getting like tagged and stuff. And I was like, whatever, not pay attention to it. So somebody approached me and said, yo, do you hear what Chris Jericho said about you? I said, what? I said, I don't know. What, what was the quote? Do you remember the quote? Cause it was something like yeah, he said an like NXT that, reject. Yeah. That uh, someone was leaking storylines. And uh, the quote is that Jericho says it was uh, an NXT reject. Yes. Okay. So I, again, I ignored it. Like, I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to get, I'm not even getting involved in this. Like, I, I didn't even know where this is coming from. So then I, people started bringing it up to me more. Most of the time looking into it. So I'm like, what is this dude talking about? So then I read, it says something like that somebody leaked that there was like a hall of famer or like a legend at, um, at AEW, like some name or something like that. And I don't, and I, and I, I, I might sound stupid saying this, but like, I probably would have walked right by him and not even noticed some, to be honest with you. But for me to go to the internet and speak on something I know nothing about, and I'm not disrespect, I, 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 I don't care that much, bro. Like, I'm not that dude. Like, for, that was so mind-blowing to me. And actually, when Impact called me, Impact called me, we thought Impact, Impact called Terry Taylor and asked him about that. And Terry called me, I said, coach, uh, I don't even know what he's talking about. Like, I would never, I don't even know what a dirt sheet is. Like, what, this is nonsense. So I never got to the bottom of it. Um, supposedly my name was involved because there was a couple of NXT guys there the same week or month I was there. But um, I can tell you from a God honest truth, man, I don't even know what I would type in to put on a dirt. Like, I don't even know how I would do it. Honestly, I don't even know what I would say. Where do I even go? So for me, that was mind blowing. Maybe that's maybe that's what Tony Khan doesn't like me on. I don't know. That could be it too. Maybe. Does this mean there's a chance for you to then go to Impact? So I did speak to Impact about three, four months ago. Um, talked to Devon. Oh, not Devon. Sorry. Um, D'Lo. D'Lo. Sorry. Yes, D'Lo. Yeah. Spoke to D'Lo. Um, great guy. Such a nice guy. Love D'Lo Brown. He, yeah, I saw your interview with him. Right, a couple what weeks a guy. ago. He's amazing. What a guy. What a great guy, man. He, uh, I had a couple of good conversations with him. Um, but I kind of faded out, man. Again, here's the problem, Chris. Tino doesn't have a name at all. I was always like, I was always like that person, like that next thing that was going to be pushed, that next big thing they were going to like surprise people with that never got an opportunity. So like, for me, it's not like everyone's knocking down my door because I don't really have a name in the wrestling world, right? And that's just a fact, right? I don't have a name to go anywhere I want. So that also hurt me because you never really built my name, right? Cause you kept telling me, Oh, we're going to make the perfect brand out of you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We don't want to throw you out there. We want to make the right fit. Well, when was the right fit? We ran out of time. So, but if that's your question, I would, I would absolutely entertain an opportunity if it was the right opportunity. Absolutely. So when was the last time you were in the ring? Was it, it, with WWE like a year ago? So my last match in the ring was like June 29th last year against Braun Breaker, the champion wow. of NXT. Yeah. And you want to know, you don't want to know something funny. I'm so happy for that guy. I'm so proud of him. He's come so far in such a short amount of time. I had a match with him and he was so green. I don't think he even knew how to sell a punch at this point. He was so, it was like his third match ever. And it, Bloom asked me to work with him. 
and he was great. Don't get me wrong, but he was just very, you know, wasn't there yet. Sure. Three months later, three months later, I see him in a title match with Ciampa on national on a, on a pay-per-view. I was like, whoa. And that's how much time has changed because when I came in, dude, you weren't touching nothing for two years. That's what mm-hmm. Triple, H, Triple H says. You're going to sit in the PC. You're going to learn the way we want you to be. So that's that just shows you how much NXT has changed. That Brown Breaker went from like just signing to now he's champion in a year, which I'm happy for him. But that's how much has changed, right? So it's yeah. crazy. So, I mean, if you've been so successful in every other avenue of your life, and the fact that you even sign with WWE is massive, where do you go from here? You and I are the exact same age, so I can relate a lot to the, you know, that big number, that big birthday we have coming up in like a year and a half. I can relate. It's like, <laughs> where do you go from here? Chris, that's a great question, man. That really is. Um, I don't know. I really don't. I, uh, it, it's scary a little bit because I, my whole life I've, I've lived off the challenge of, 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 of a competitive edge of, you know, football and the wrestling. And I still have it, man. I really, really do. I still think I keep myself in elite shape. I'm a competitor. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, kind of like what we touched on earlier. I, I've, I really do believe the character Tino could be really successful in the right opportunity. Yeah. I just don't know, like you said, 38, uh, haven't really had a huge name. I had a couple injuries, a botch surgery, bad timing. So, like, is that door closed? I don't know. And, and to be honest with you, I would love an opportunity to, to, to expose, to put Tino out there. But at this part of my life, it, it's not, I'm not just going to go to anything and wrestle. You know what I'm saying? It's just not going to be something I'm not really interested in the sense of, like, do you want to do this little show for X amount of, you know, it's just like, I don't know, man. Cause for me, it's like, it's always an end goal, right? Yeah. For me, it, it, it's a challenge. It's, it's for me, it was like, wow, I get to be in WWE. It's it, that's the Mecca of professional wrestling. Like that's it. You made it right. That, that's my challenge. I want a main event WrestleMania. That's, that was my goal. Like if you're not trying to main event WrestleMania, what are you doing yeah. in this industry? Right. So for me, it was like, that's the end goal. The end goal is to be the best. The end goal is to, to be the best I could be, outwork everybody, and, and, and main event WrestleMania. That's the goal. If that's not reality anymore, do I take my energy and do I take my challenge somewhere else? That's, that's kind of where I'm at in my life right now, to be totally honest and, with you. Would you go and play football again? I mean, <laughs> P.O. is playing football again. Johnny Manziel's playing football right now. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I mean, I've been out of football for a while now, man. I, I I'm sure I you could still go. You know what? It's uh, actually funny. I'm going this weekend. We, we're, I'm leaving Friday with Ray Lewis. Uh, he's got his camp in Cleveland. It's a top 75 high school running backs and linebackers in, in, in high school football. So the Under Armour puts on this big camp. So he actually asked me to come with him and help out with the linebackers. And I was making a joke with him the other night. I was like, yo, can I put the cleats on a little bit? Can we, can we, but you know, I would love to, but you know, it's, it's scary, Chris. Like you said, we're at that age now. It's like, um, you know, what's next in my sense, because that's kind of been my whole life, right? What, funny, what's though, because, challenge? Like I said, we're the same age, but I don't feel like there's anything I can't do at 38 that I couldn't do at 28, couldn't do at 18. But I also understand that, you know, I'm not trying to be a pro athlete. And I, I, I can, I can, I can understand that, like, you know, we're getting close to 40 here and it's, it's just, it's a different mentality, but if I feel like there's nothing that I can't do at this age, I, I would imagine it's the same for you. Cause you look, you know, 10 times better than me. You know, you know, you say that that's funny. You say that cause I'm a big believer. Um, and that's why the age thing really rubbed me the wrong way because it's a, a general statement, right? But if you take pride in taking care of yourself, self-care, training, uh, you know, recovery, eating right, drinking, you know, water. So for me, it's like people don't realize I, I committed my whole life to being the best version of me as an athlete. You know, I always said to myself, if it doesn't make me better, don't do it. So never drank in high school, never drank in college, never drank in professional, never did drugs, never smoked. Not because I wanted that I was different or be better than anybody. I looked at it like, that's not going to make me better, right? Yeah. Going out and partying is not going to make me a better football player. Going out and partying is not going to make me a better athlete or, or, or a professional wrestler. So for me, I dedicated my whole life to be 
in the shape I'm in today. So for Vince or somebody to say to me, oh, you're getting too old. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Show me a 23-year-old that looks better than me, who's more athletic than me, and can do more than I can. Because if he can't, I'll walk away. That's That was my outlook, right? Like, And I approach life like that every day. Like, be the best version of yourself at whatever age you're at. Like, if you're at 40, be elite, at, elite shape at 40. If you're at 50, be in elite shape at 50. Yeah, you can't look like you did at 20, at 50 maybe, but like, you can be in the best shape of your life. So for me, it's like, do I think I can run circles around anybody in WWE? Absolutely. Do I do I really think that I was one of the best elite athletes ever set foot in WWE? Hands down. And if anybody wants to argue, go ahead and argue because I'll, I'll I'll throw out stats right now. I set records at the NFL Combine. Like that's a fax, right? So for me, it's like that that rubbed me the wrong way. Somebody said to me about age, right? I look, I was like, no one's built like me. Who's built like me in WWE? Who's built like me? Honestly, you love wrestling. Name one person who's built like Tino. Just Austin gentle. Theory, I guess, is the first one that comes to mind for me. Okay. Awesome. Great dude. Great athleticism. You know, he's about 5'11", 6 foot, and he's like 200 pounds. I'm talking about 6'3", 240. You know, World-class you, athlete. You remind me of in WCW, there was a faction called the Natural Born Thrillers, and it was Sean O'Hare, above average Mike Sanders, Sean Stasiak, uh, yep. Chuck Palumbo. Mark Jindrak, I'm going to forget a name here, but like five super athletic, incredibly jacked dudes. And you would have been like the perfect member of like the 2022 version of the Natural Born Thrillers. <laughs> yeah, it's, listen, awesome theory. Listen, that guy's got an incredible upside. He's young, he's talented, good looking dude, looks great, works hard. Um, and, but th- to me, that'd be a challenge. Like I'd be like, okay, that's, that's your benchmark right there there it is 20 how old is he 23 24 yeah it's like 24 yeah 24 man maybe 25 at the most I don't know. okay I'll look it up so that people won't uh, get upset in the comments here <laughs> no i mean he's probably incredible dude love the dude i think love he's him. got incredible. I mean, that guy's, guy. guy's gonna be a star he is 24 like for, 24 there you go see how quick you are 24 see for me i'm 38 but if anybody challenged me i'd stand in the center of the ring with that dude and go move for move with him athletically athletically all day because you got to understand, and I could say that with confidence because I put in the work, yeah. right? I put in the work. And yeah. even to this day, I'm still in, in elite shape, right? I think the only person who's, uh, who, who you would, I think, aesthetically look like would be Orton. But Orton has 20 years and, you know, the pedigree. Of, Legend. You know. Legend. Right. I, re- I remember, funny story, I remember the first person that said to me, you, you look like a little bit of Randy Orton. And I was like, please, man, don't don't ever say that to me again. Number one, he's a legend, right? He's he's a, he's a pioneer in the sport. He, he's a guy who you're gonna fail if you get compared to him, right? Per se. I mean, that dude is sure. is one of the best has ever done it. I, I I had the privilege to watch him work in the ring a few times, like really up close. Actually, SummerSlam was one time I, I snuck out, and the guy's unbelievable. But I was getting a lot of comparisons, man. You this is a little Randy Orton. This could be the next Randy. This looks like Randy Orton, and it's. To me, it was like, slow down, because that was the same thing that happened to me in the NFL. That was kind of like a setup for failure, you know, a white safety, the next John Lynch. It's like, hold on, man, John Lynch is a legend. Like, don't don't put that benchmark on somebody right now, you know? And that's the same thing with Randy, man. That's he's a legend, man, in the game. Did you feel more pressure in the NFL or in WWE? <laughs> pressure. Oh, that's a good question, Chris. Um. You know, I, I think I was more nervous at the beginning because I wasn't good. You know, I was learning the craft. In WWE. Um, in WWE, yes. In WWE because I was, I was new, right? So you, you can't cheat experience. Can't cheat it. You have to do it. So you have to get match after match after match under your belt to progressively get more confident. So for me, I think I was a lot more nervous and pressure in wrestling because... I just wasn't good yet. And I was trying to get better every day. So for me, like in, 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 in football, it was like, I remember in college football, uh, I was had the privilege to start my sophomore year. And my first start ever in college was against LSU in front of 98,000 people when they were the national champs the year before. So it was college game day, national TV. I was so nervous. I couldn't even drink my water bottle. I was like this on the sidelines after the, before the first play. The second play of the game, I picked it off for an interception. 
and ran it back like 20 yards. After that, I felt like I never had that nervous feeling again because I almost felt like, okay, I belong. I worked hard to get here and now I'm here. Wrestling, it was like the moment, I remember the moment I had that was against Ty Dillinger. Remember him as AEW now? Sean Spears. Sean Spears, great guy. He was the first match I ever had where he really helped me. He really helped me through the match. And I actually went behind the curtain, Chris, and I actually cried. I shed some tears, man, because it was like, wow, that's what it feels like to have a, a D at that time. I said a good match, but it was probably only a decent match, but I was so grateful to Sean and Ty Dillinger was his name, but I was so grateful because he actually kind of like took me under his wing a little bit and said, Hey man, I got you young pup. Like I got you. So we had a good match, like the crowd reaction, the booze, the cheers. And I remember going back and I sat, I sat in the locker room and I just kind of started shedding some tears. And I was like, wow, like, okay. Sorry to pay off a little bit. Cause it was frustrating. Chris, I'll tell you something, man. It was, it was tough. It was humbling. I went through a mental struggle because it was tough, man. I, I wasn't good. You know, and it must have been a real struggle because I'm, I'm guessing football came probably pretty easy for you. You know, it's not that football came easy. Uh, sports came, being an athlete came easy. I loved it. I love the challenge. Right. Yeah. So here's another story. That's, that's crazy. That no one really believes or knows. I didn't start playing football until I was 17 years old. 90 95% of all NFL players, you could probably look this up. I would say 90, 90% of all NFL players start by the age of seven. I didn't start playing until I was 17. So it was baseball before then, right? I was a professional. I actually got what I got drafted coming out of high school to play professional baseball. Wow. But I actually fell in love with football my senior year. And I had... So in high school, real quick, in high school, to get recruited to a big college, you got to have a really good junior year, right? You got to blow up and then go in your senior year, everyone's looking at you. Yeah. Well, my junior year was my first year playing. So I was a nobody. I was just running around out there. I didn't know what I was doing. So my senior year, I ended up blowing up. I got defensive player of the year in South Florida. I was the MVP of our team and we were like 10 and one. Long story short, I had zero big time scholarship offers. Zero, 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 zero. zero. So now I'm like, hold on. Like I fell in love with this, but I, no one was giving me opportunities. So for me, that was like, I wouldn't say it didn't come easy because it didn't come easy, but like being a competitor came easy, if that makes any sense, you yeah. know? Yeah. I got you. How did you and Mandy first meet? Mandy. <laughs> oh man. Actually the, when she was doing the show tough enough. Okay. So the first time I met Mandy, I remember uh, when they were filming the show tough enough they had the little, they called it like a bunk, whatever it was next to the PC. They, had a little, they built out like a little warehouse right next to the PC in Orlando where they were keeping everybody for the show. So they had like no life. And I remember seeing them a couple of times like walk through the PC and I was like, wow, that, that girl's cute. Like, I, you know, I was kind of checking out, like joking around with my, my buddies and I've always thought she was beautiful. I really did. Um, and I actually met her for the first time uh, in the PC. And we were just talking briefly. And then, you know, I watched her go through the show and she did great. And then she got signed. Um, and I'll tell you one thing about Mandy. The what attracted to me here the most beautiful woman, obviously everyone knows she's gorgeous. Her personality and her down to earth persona just drew me to her. She was such, so easy to talk to. Like, I was like, wow, like such a beautiful woman got everything together and she could have a conversation. Like, and I, I know it sounds funny, but like sometimes you see these pretty women, they're kind of distant, they're stuck up, but she was just such a genuine person. And um, at the time she had a serious boyfriend, she was engaged. So we were just friends, you know, we were just friends. And uh, after she broke up, it kind of escalated from there, man. So what was you your know, first day? I, if, I, if I turned my phone, if I turned my phone, that's her wall. Ah, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great, wow. So this, yeah, yeah this actually, is our give us office. The full, give us the full scope of your wall. I, we can only see what was behind your head there. Oh, so my. By wall the way, is... I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. Really? I moved you know, to I was, Cleveland. I, was... in, I moved to Cleveland in 2010, which is when I became a Browns fan, which is I think the year that you played there. So funny about Cleveland. So I get traded to Cleveland. It's a true story. So I was trying to get not to get deep into that, but I was trying to get traded the whole year because it was my contract year. I got hurt. They benched me. We were getting, we had a problem the year before. So long story short, they wouldn't trade me. Finally, they trade me to Cleveland at all places. 
I was supposed to go to like New Orleans or Jackson. I go to Cleveland. I'm like, Cleveland? Okay. So I get on a plane. This is a true story. We play Sunday night football in Tampa against Baltimore. On like November 29th, like 80 degrees. I get traded to Cleveland. I fly up there. Like December 2nd. It's snowing. Okay. I leave December 7th. It's still snowing. Like I lost my car in the parking lot three times under snow. Right. I, I call my agent and I'm like, yo, I, I say, can I, I, I don't, I was, it was in my contract here. I was like, I don't know if I could sign back here. Like I was like, it's been snowing for five straight weeks. I was like, I, I was like, really? I mean, can we get a warmer, warmer team? So I was, again, I was actually, I was only there for five weeks, but they were a great organization, great team. It was actually, it was a privilege to be there as well. Man, it's it was fun cool. to be there. Where did you live in Cleveland, by the way? I didn't live anywhere. They actually put me in a condo. Uh, Cause I was only, there. it was like the, there's only six weeks left in the season. So they put me in like a, like a, like a, one of the team condos. Down so, in Korea? I don't, to be honest with you, Chris, I don't know. Was it, by, or was it downtown near the stadium? It was downtown close to the stadium. Oh, okay. I think I know exactly where that is. Cause Berea it was is where, uh, like, you know, where they do all the practices. Yes. Yeah. So like, you know, I'll tell you one thing. That was the coldest game I've ever played in my life. And let me tell you I something. I was probably there. <laughs> so it was against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Last game in the season. I, I can uh, I can guess who won that game. <laughs> <laughs> well, that being said, the most loyal and amazing fans, because you know there wasn't an empty seat in the stadium, and it was I know. I'll never forget it. It was 17 degrees, wind chill was negative 17 degrees. That was the first time, Chris, that I actually sat on the bench. And was watching the clock tick, and I was like, "Come on, man! Can you click tick faster? Come on, can you click down faster?" Like, <laughs> like I didn't even want to hit nobody because it was like you would hit somebody, and your whole bones would just like jar. It was unbelievable. It was, and that's that's when I called my agent. I said, "I said his name was Ken at the time." I said, "Ken, I don't know, man." I said, "I mean, I don't mind the cold, but this is a whole different level." There is a direct correlation between how cold and miserable the weather is in a city and how much the people love the sports teams. Because think about it. Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, 100%. Green Bay, love the teams. And no disrespect to your team, Tampa Bay, but like there's a lot of other things to do in Tampa. You just, you just hit the nail on the head, Chris. You got to understand one thing. There is no fan base like Green Bay, Buffalo, Kansas City, uh, Cleveland, you know why? Because there's nothing to do on Sundays. That's like what they love. That is what the, the towns, yeah. that's what they do. The, the, the Green Bay shuts down on Sundays, right? Kansas City didn't have an empty seat the, when I was there for two years. They didn't have an empty seat in the stadium. But you got to think about it. The Dolphin Stadium, the Tampa Bay Stadium, and Jacksonville. Arizona, the, yep. Arizona, Sandy, they're all fair weather fans because on Sunday, let, let's go out in our boat on South Beach. Let, let's go to the beach, right? Nobody wants to sit in Miami Stadium in 90 degree weather with the sun beating on them. So, and, and this is not like disrespectful thing. Like they don't, Florida doesn't support their teams like up north. They just don't. There's no fan I lived base in like Miami it. for five years. I get it. Also, you know, Miami Gardens is a tough sell. <laughs> Absolutely. Where do you live now? I was there from 2014 to 2019. I, I owned a house in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, so where do you live now? You live in South Florida still? I'm now? in Los Angeles now. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Are you like you in, is, you, is this dream house you're talking about in Boca? It's actually in the border of Delray and Boynt. It's nice. um, yeah. You know what's funny, Chris? I I you know you know South Florida a little bit. We live in Miami. Do you live close to the beach? I was like two miles from the beach in Fort Lauderdale. Oh, where where, where did you live in Fort Lauderdale? I was in Oakland Park, so I was just east of 95 so mandy used to have a house in victoria park right there right off sunrise oh, no, she would have been five minutes from me yeah so she actually just sold it because we actually we got this house we're in this house together so we you know we we made it our home you know we, we this is actually the first time i've lived with a woman i'm 38 years old so it's been the transitional phases but she actually sold her house in victoria park and i was living i was going there a lot because i had my house in tampa and she had her house in florida so we go back and forth but um, that being said, I, I grew up in East Boca, right? I, I grew up two miles from the beach. So I loved East, right? I love the beach. So that being said, I never bought my home East because obviously like to get what you really want East is, is big money and you don't get the land. No, it's, it's, you know what I learned? 
when we when we moved out here and then we would go back east to go to Victoria Park, the traffic would drive me crazy. I said, I gotta get out of here. It's the it's 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 ridiculous when you actually you know get away from it for a little bit and come back to it, you're like, whoa, this is it's that east is busy, man. Busy, busy, busy. Yeah, out there. yeah. You've mentioned Ray Lewis a few times, and I'm just I'm wondering how you guys connected in the first place. So I got lucky, man. This is a quick funny story. 2011. It was the year before he won the Super Bowl. Okay. So he got knocked out. Remember, he got knocked out in the NFC Championship game against Tom Brady, the New England Patriots. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember, the field goal miss went wide right. Okay. Literally three days later. So he had an off season house in Del, in a high, right by me in Highland Beach. And my off season condo was in Delray by the water. So we were like a mile apart. But he didn't know my name, but he knew that I played the NFL. Like, if he would see me, he'd be like, what's up, young pup? How you doing? Blah, blah, blah. But, like, he wouldn't, like, call me by my name. Sure. So one night I, I see him out, and we were on the Atlantic Ave. You ever been to Atlantic Ave, right? Nice little chill spot. We are having dinner. And he saw me, gave me a hug, and it was right after he lost to the Patriots. And I just said, you know, sorry about that, blah, blah, blah. Well, all of a sudden he says to me, hey, young pup, you got to come work out with me one day. And I was like a little kid in the candy store. I'm like, you know, Ray Lewis, like you're a legend. Like, of course, right? So that was a Friday night, Friday night. I'll never forget, get his number. So I text him Sunday night, like a little kid. So I'm like, hey, uh, what, what time Monday morning? He's like, be at the house at 9 a.m. Doesn't say anything, just be at the house at 9 a.m. So I'm like a little kid. I got my backpack on, got my workout gear. I'm like 30 years old, but I'm like, like six years in the league, but I'm still like a little kid, right? So I knock on the door, you know, big old house on the water. I'm like my dream house on the water, you know, ocean. Knock on the door. All of a sudden, the garage opens. Beautiful gym, right? He's like, let's go, young pup. So the fast forward, nobody comes back to work out with Ray Lewis. He's that <laughs> intense. No, I'm, I'm being serious. Like, wow. I mean, even in my stint with him, Ed Reed, people would come and never come back. So long story short, all, every day I'm texting him, what time tomorrow? What time tomorrow? And he's like, I could tell he was like slowly like, like looking at me sideways, like, okay, this kid's serious. Like, okay, this kid can be almost a little bit of a, a force, like a little bit of a motivation for me. So long story short, Chris, we trained twice a day, every day, the whole off season leading up where he won the Super Bowl. Okay. Wow. Every day. He actually, I started getting so close with him that he would bring me on his jet sometimes. He would bring me around his family. He never did that. Like Ray was obviously Ray Lewis. He's very closed in. Even like his closest childhood friends would be like, he must really like you because he's bringing you around like his family already. Like, so long, let's fast forward. So every day he worked out. He won the Super Bowl. So again, I never knew like why he took a liking to me or like why we connected, but we just, every day we trained. So he won the Super Bowl. It was kind of a good moment. You know, I was texting him. So his Hall of Fame speech a couple of years ago, you know, he invited me, obviously, we're, now we're so close, but we're sitting at a table and I'll never forget this. And this was a kind of like, a, for me, it was like, I was just, I just felt like so, so humble and, and grateful for this moment. We're sitting at a table and uh, he's telling a story about his career. And like he said, nobody comes back to work out with him. So he looks, he doesn't even look at me and he points to me and he's like, this is one of the only athletes that ever came back every single day. And he goes, he actually pushed me the last year I won the Super Bowl. And he never said that to me before. Like, he's never said it to me. But that's where it clicked. Like, I earned his respect in a sense. was like, he was like, wow, this, this kid is, is here to work. Like, mm. and I mean, he would text me at like six at night sometimes. Hey, come over, man. Let's, let, let's get a beach workout. Let's, and I was always there. So I think that's how we became close. And then he just became one of my mentors. And we just went on vacation like three weeks ago together. And we're real close. And we're going this weekend. So like, I'm just humbled to have a guy like that in my life. Because, you know, even when I was struggling with the transitional phase from out of the NFL, he really kept me um, focused. He really kept me humbled. He kept me like out of that depression state because it was just instilling the, the work ethic, right? Like his, his quote that he told me, I'll never forget. He said to me, he goes, the only thing that follows hard work is results. He said, it might not always be the result you're working for. He goes, but it's going to be a good result. And to me, that's something that I've kind of lived by because the perfect situation is WWE. I was in elite shape training every day to get back in the NFL, but NFL never called me. WWE called me because they saw me with my shirt off in a gym training. And they said, who was that? Mm. So the story I tell is like, 
I was working my butt off to become, you know, back in the NFL, but because I was such good shape, I got an opportunity to go in another professional industry. So that's the perfect example of, you know, only thing that follows hard work is results. Mm. So think about that's that. Such a great quote. That is such a good think quote. All that. of this has been so good. Oh man, I, I love I, I, again, man. So it's a privilege. Your your podcasts are good, man. I love them. Man, was that really? Is that really how you got discovered? You were working out with no shirt on, and somebody. So, so Canyon Seaman saw me supposedly. Um, Canyon Seaman knew. Okay, so another good friend of mine, a uh, really good friend of mine, one of my closest friends is Rashad Evans, the old UFC fighter. Or Sugar, yeah. Sugar Shad, yeah. yeah Sugar He's Shad. another guy who. Uh, I'm really close with and just just I talk to him three, four times a week. Just a, just such a nice, humble, down to earth individual. But long story short, I was training with him one day um, and we were in like the MMA gym back in the day. It was called like Black Zillions. And Canyon was there trying to scout some like MMA fighters or whatever. And I had my shirt off and I was training with Rashad. We were hitting the mitts and he asked Rashad's agent, who, who the heck is this guy? And he told him, oh, ex NFL, blah, blah, blah. So that's when can that's when his Rashad's agent asked me if I could like if can get my information. I said, yeah, so the Canyon called me. So, but again, that's how it kind of worked. Like they saw me with my shirt off, like, you know, and they said, Oh, ex ex NFL, ex athlete. Okay, that's what see, that's what Canyon was hired by Vince to really get that portion of you know, the ex-college athletes, the ex-athletes, and then even the older crowd. So even when like Canyon told me the story, when Vince said age, Canyon was like, Hold on, like you've been telling me that you want like older, more mature, like why you want young all of a sudden. So that was a big thing for him too. That kind of threw him for a loop. Look, that may change in like the next six months and then you're back in there. hundred percent. It's a fact, you know, it's funny. It's a, uh, my brother, who's a diehard wrestling fan. He said the same thing to me this weekend. He's like, it's, it could be a fad. It's like Vince could change his idea uh, next month. He can say, Hey, you know what? I don't want no more young. I want grown, you know? So you're absolutely a hundred percent correct. Everybody's saying that, you know? Look, I end every conversation with the same question. And I know you're going to love this because you posted a video on Instagram about this recently. I, I love gratitude. I know that you do as well. I always end with the same question. What are three things in your life that you're grateful for right now? That I'm grateful for right now? Mandy's number one. I'm extremely grateful for Mandy to have a woman like that in my life. I'm blessed. Um, I'm extremely grateful for my health, man. Uh, my family. What else? Um, that's such a great question, actually, Chris. It really is a great question. Grateful for. I think that so often, and the reason I ask is so often people focus on the things they don't have in their life rather than focusing on the things they do have in their life. And I think that if you can have that gratitude for the great things that you do have, you start to realize, well, I do actually have a lot of great things in my life. You know, Chris, that, that is a hundred percent correct. And I love that you said that, man, because that's, that's where this society is a little misconstrued, man. They look at Instagram, social media, and they think someone's happier than they are because they post these pictures and it's kind of a facade. And, you know, I think as you get older, like you said, you have to really, really look in your life and just be so grateful for what you have and what you're appreciative of. Right. And if you focus on that, you won't focus on what you you always got to work for something, but if you're grateful for what you have, it'll make you appreciate everything so much more, right? Absolutely. And that's for me is, and the funny thing for me, man, it, it's, uh, I know this is our first conversation, but the part of life I'm at right now is that's my number one thing I'm focused on. I have a morning routine that I'm big on. And the first thing in my morning routine is I sit outside in my backyard for 10 minutes and I just thank God. I thank God for everything he's given me. I thank God for this beautiful house, Mandy, uh, my family, because sometimes when you're caught up in it, right, you don't appreciate what you've accomplished or what you've done or what you have, because yeah. you always want more. You always want more, right? And I remember my mom used to tell me in college, she'd say, Sam, enjoy, enjoy college. No, mom, no, mom, I want to get to the NFL. I want to get to the NFL. And I kind of regret it because, um, those are the moments that you can never get back. And I actually, I actually, I always text Mandy every Tuesday night before our matches and I always say something nice, but I always say, you know, live in the moment, like be grateful for the moment because you never know when it's going to end because it's going to end for everybody. Right. So if you really try to live in the moment and appreciate the moment, then you will enjoy the journey better. 
And um, to answer your question, man, what I'm grateful for, honestly, is is, is Mandy, my family, my health, and um, peace. I really, I feel like for the first time, I'm a little bit, I'm at peace with my life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that takes a long time to kind of get there, man. It, it really is. That, that, that peace part is, people struggle with it, man. I struggle with it every day. But peace is something that I think you need to find because peace will keep you in a positive outlook. Yeah. You know? So know. this has been such a great conversation. Thank you for being so open, so honest, and just also so awesome. <laughs> no, man, I appreciate it. Listen, I hope I, you know, I, I want to, when you, it's funny, you reached out to me for some reason, I really wanted to get on your podcast when I saw it. And then you reached out because actually a couple of people reached out like maybe last couple of weeks, I kind of turned them all down, but maybe I'll jump on a little more. I just, you know, you look like more like a, just a, like a nice inter interaction guy, not just wrestling, 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 you know, life. And for me, it's like, um, I just want to be careful opening up so much because I want people to look at this and be like, oh, he's this, he's that, he's that, whatever. But it's it's about being yourself, man, too, right? You know, you just got to yeah. be open about it. And I love having these conversations. And uh, it's like people got to hear this stuff because some people don't understand what, what athletes or what entertainers have to go through or what they've been through or what they went through, right? They see on TV, they see this, they see that. They don't really know what they sacrificed. They don't know how much commitment and and work ethic they put in there right so for me it's like i love these kind of podcasts man and honestly congratulations on all your success what you do is great man i watch your instagram i see your youtube man honestly it really is special to watch i i'm so glad we had this conversation so absolutely thank you and i can't wait to see what's next for you in whatever it is that you want to do yeah i'm excited i uh i'm i'm excited because i i, I i'm a big believer i'm a really big believer that uh the harder you work, the opportunities will open up. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see where I'm at in a year or two or three or whatever it is, man. I'm excited for the future, though. Well, Sabby, thank you so much, man. Hey, thank you. And anytime you want me, I'll come on. I'll tell Mandy to come on your show. She said she did a little clip of your show one time. She was on my show about two years ago when her yeah. fitness app was coming out. She was on the show. Yes, as she said. Fitness. So she'll have to come back on the show. Absolutely. I don't even know where she's at in the house right now. Well, I'll tell her we say hello. <laughs> 